Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new, when an age ends, and when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, finds utterance. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. <laughs> More bloody junk. Oh, right. More bloody junk. Oh, come on. Let's get weaving. Get these sheets off. See what we got. Don't just drop them anywhere. Fold them up. Fold, savvy. this here? Tiger! Stuffed! You know, I just about worked that out for myself. They shoot them, then they stuff them. Sir! Well, that's all right, Sergeant. Good Lord. Is this some more? Oh, right, so, sir. Oh, I found this trunk. Well, do we know whose it is? No, so I reckon it's been here for years. Let's have a shifty. Sir, you can be getting the, this stuff down to the lorries. Oh, well. Mm. Can't jettison the fancy dress, eh? I'm, uh, sorry about him, sir. Oh, no matter, Sergeant. After all, it is their day, their freedom, all they've fought for, hmm? If you say so, sir. Mm. Oh, now, what else? Huh. Bet that hasn't seen service for a year or two. I think that's scotch. I think it is, sir. Well, that's one for the books. You fancy a chota? Yes, sir. Thank you. Kera, sir. Kera. A drink. Join us. Uh, please, sir, yes. Splendid. Ah. Well, now, here's to, uh... Yes, why not? To the king. With whom we need not, I think, couple the name of Mr. Athley. His Majesty. Oh, I'll tell you what, Sergeant, I've been looking at... I'm sorry, Colonel. That's all right, Major. The sergeant and I just found ourselves caught up in the general atmosphere of jubilation. <laughs> Do join us. Some bloody wogs whipped the battery from the Land Rover. Oh, not Broad again. daylight. Anything that doesn't nail down. They've stripped the cellar. Well, your health, Colonel. Well? well? Don't just stand there gawping. I assume all this stuff's got to be moved. Yes, sir. But get moving it, then. Yes, sir. Quite a bright little chap, that one. Half devil, quite possibly, but hardly half child. I'm sorry, Colonel? It was Kipling. Don't you know it? Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. Wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild. Your new court, sullen peoples, half devil. Half child. Yeah, we used to have to learn that by heart at preparatory school. Yes, I didn't go to preparatory school, Colonel. I know you didn't, Major. 
But nonetheless, it sounds an eminently appropriate description. Is it true, sir? They'll all be able to come to England now to live. Well, we are the mother country, after all. Right, Sergeant. Get this lock loaded, sir. Carry on the good work, Kira. Uh, you want tiger, sir? Of course we want the bloody tiger. We shot it. Going straight back, sir? Oh, no, not straight away. I want to go south to Terrapore, Old Garrison. Just once before I go. Yeah, well, let's get on. Yes, sir. Kira, I want the rest of this stuff down in ten minutes. And you say yes, sir, don't you? Yes, sir. Right, let's get this bloody show on the road. Britannicus sum. <laughs> I'm a British citizen. <laughs> Comrades and friends, once again it falls to me on this our special day to say a word or two. And I can promise that I won't detain you long. Well, that'll be the day. <laughs> Though I do believe that a good speech would be like a woman's skirt. Short enough to arouse interest, but long enough to cover the subject. <laughs> yes, anyway, all I really wanted to say is how good it is to see a, a group of people like this, particularly the young ones. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. As we know, as we've seen in Grosvenor Square, a lot of today's young people are attracted to communism as an alternative to the evils of the capitalist system. And they are right, it is an alternative. Under capitalism, man is exploited by man, but under communism, it's precisely the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that, don't we? Hmm? That's because you told it last year. <laughs> and there's more where that came from. <laughs> oh, no, just the one I promised <laughs> story I once heard about uh, two businessmen, in fact, two Jewish businessmen, oh. discussing ethics on a train. <laughs> And this one says, I have a story that tells you perfectly the problem of ethics already. <laughs> Here I am in this shop, I run with my partner, hi, and this man comes in to get his suit. And I say it is ten pounds and uh, he gives me the money. But when he's gone away, I found that by mistake, he has given me twenty pounds already. <laughs> so here, as I say, I have the ultimate ethical problem. Do I or do I not tell my partner? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have to tell anyone here about that kind of ethic, do I? Yeah. Well, that's my lot. So without further ado, can I ask you to raise your glasses and join with me in... Yes, who is it? David Maxwell, sir. Thank you for laying the gift. Sorry. Sorry. Once again, can I ask you to join with me in toasting the memory of the man who... In Birmingham today, the right on Enoch Powell, shadow spokesman on defence. We must be mad, he says. It's like we're building up our own funeral pyre. He talks of grinning piccaninnies, quotes about excreta pushed through letterboxes. He sees the river Tiber foaming with much blood. So, happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Comrades, for years, I've been battering against a bolted door. 
Now it's open. In 47, came on home. Sergeant Turner to a Midlands town. Another England, brash and bold. A new world, brave and bright and cold. The sergeant looks at England and it's changed before his eyes. Old virtues, thrift and prudence, are increasingly despised. Old values are devalued as the currency inflates. Old certainties are scoffed at by the new sophisticates. And capital and labour wield an ever bigger clout. And it's him that's in the middle. And it's him that's losing out. Sergeant Turner, NCO. Where's he going? Doesn't know. What is it, Mr. Turner? Oh, nothing. Is there a bit of trouble with the lease? Needs sorting out. Where's Paul? It's gone 20 past. I don't know. Oh, hello, operator. Uh, yes, that's right. No, no, a firm, a company. Uh, ideal locations. Line discontinued, what does that mean? Let's see. Uh, no, no. Right, uh, thank you very much. It's defunct. Yeah, you are. Defunct, love. The company's defunct. Oh, I'm sorry, look, I should have called round before. I'm, I'm, my name's Goodman, Monty Goodman. Uh, my call. But, uh, Yes, you were right. They are not defunct. In fact, they are your new landlord. What do you mean? <laughs> they sold the building, love. Who asked? Your old landlord. Uh-huh. Uh... Now, uh, let's get this no, straight. Oh, true, it's a He did put up quite a fight. In fact, in the end, they go on to the local council, do a bit of bartering. You then with the purchase order on its way, you couldn't see your landlord's signature for dust. I don't quite understand. No, our oh, love. Words of one. They've bought the house. They've bought a sod in street for redevelopment. Who has? They have. The Metropolitan Investment Trust. The same. But well, why? Look, it's the oldest in the business, isn't it, love? Shell companies. You buy them all complete. Well, you buy a few, in fact, for the deals. To conceal the fact that the whole street is being bought by one developer, otherwise the prices go sky high. <laughs> I'm joking, I've got a 12-year lease. Yes, now, there you are correct. The thing is, you'll notice, um, on your lease, yes, that the, uh, the rent is subject to uh, periodical reviews. Now, need I say more? You can't do that. No, there you are incorrect. Look, I love... It's all sewn up. There's nothing you can do about it. You bastard. No. Oh, my cells do me. Like him. Why destroy my life, Leo? Because my joy destroying you will make someone, somewhere, some money. <laughs> Look, old Shirley. You know your basic handicap? All of you. The little man, the honest trader. Lack of vision. Suffering a gross deficiency of greed. You got three weeks old, love. I'm sorry, Mr. Turner. Overslept. Mr. Turner, what was it? Doesn't matter, Paul. In 47, came on home. Colonel Chandler, monochrome. Another England, rough and raw, not gentle, sentimental as before. 
became a politician, not to master, but to serve, to keep a careful finger on the grassroots Tory nerve. Like any born to riches, not to plunder, but to give. Always a little liberal, a great conservative. But as his seat grows marginal, his powers less secure. His responsive elder statements sound increasingly unsure. Colonel Chandler passed his prime, dignified, worthy, out of time. Colonel Chandler, oyster-eyed, one fine summer morning, died. Extension 237, please. Hello, Maggie. I'm at Tadley 1558. T-A-D-D-L-E-Y. Well, it's somewhere near West Bromwich. Anyway, I'll be here 20 minutes, gone an hour, and then back until about 5.30. A funeral. Now, look, Maggie, can you get me running yields on all the inter-Americans, first thing? That's right. And get Bill to check me futures on the Chicago Soft sometime before lunch. No, that's all. And you, sweetheart. Bye. Business goes on, eh, Peter? I'm afraid the market is no respecter of grief. Coffee? Oh, tell very much. Uh, milk, no sugar. Yes, we're all right. Sorry to see him go. Yeah. I think, actually, constituency people probably knew him better than I did. Could be. I imagine it was a much safer seat in the old days. Oh, well. Rural, indeed. Nowadays, of course, with the new estates, it's very dodgy. Did he ever think of retiring? Talked about it for ten years. But they don't, do they? Old Tories never die. They just get redistributed. Peter. It's probably not the right time to bring it up, but the by-election writ's on the cards any day now, and I gather central office are thinking of keeping it family. Perhaps we could have a chat. Yeah. Indeed, why don't we? I'm in no hurry to get back up. We could have a drink or something. Point out the landmines. <laughs> not that many. Just bear in mind you're in Enoch country. You'll be all right. Enoch country? The ground fairly thick with their Commonwealth cousins. Well, yes, on that one, I think I should make it clear. Oh, I, I shouldn't. Should what? Make it clear. Because all they'll say is you don't have to live with them. Hello, Peter. Auntie. Coffee, Sarah. Oh, yes, I'd love some, Frank. Oh, Peter, do you know Frank Kershaw? Yes, of course oh. I know Frank. <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, hello, Hello. Central office very sweetly sent him to represent the party. Ah, well, now that's not quite true, Peter. Dozens of them wanted to come, but your aunt insisted. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Frank, Jim Platt, foreman, isn't it? A works manager. Sorry, works manager of Baron Castings, local foundry, and more importantly, constituency chairman. Uh, Jim, this is Frank Kershaw, whose many commercial concerns are far too numerous to mention. Oh, yes, we all know Mr. Kershaw. I didn't know my fame had spread so far. There you are, you see, Frank. Because, actually, we're one of his numerous concerns. Small? What did you say, your Baron Castings? Oh, yes, yes. You're doing rather well, aren't you? That's not quite correct, Mr. Kershaw. It'd be a bit more accurate to say we're doing rather badly. No one's doing well, after all. <laughs> Over the old days, eh? The workshop of the world, imperial protection, send a gunboat, show the IMF who's boss. Ah, sun will never set, eh, Jim? Last a thousand years. There was something to be said for it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean... It's all right, Peter. Of course, I know it's all changed. The nation. And indeed, the party. Not guardians of the empire anymore, but sharp young men with coloured shirts and cockney accents, reading The Economist. <coughs> I think I heard the car. You should hear Peter Frank, he's really quite amusing. Especially when they talk about the Dunkirk spirit. 
says we're the only nation in the world that's inspired by the battles we lost. I'm sorry. Doesn't matter, Peter. Yes, it was certainly a car. Yes, there it is. Oh. Hello. Uh, just, uh, I wanted to pay my respects. I mean, you know, we, we had our differences in recent time, but uh, nonetheless, my old commanding officer. Um, perhaps I... Thank you, Mr. Turner. And a half. Uh, right, so, calculations are as follows. 40 union delegates, eligible. I reckon them as turns up break circa 50-50. So, one for yourself. Thanks. There you go. And then there's uh, odds and sods, like uh, women, YS, and the co-op. All for you, okay. Okay. Right, so the keys, the wards. Right, now. Um, right wing wards, the ones you lost already, they're marked in pink here, look. Uh, here we are. There. Now the reds you got, no bother. That's Grimley and Broughton Park. All right. The floaters, Stourford and West Thorston. See? Now, as it happens, neither of the floaters got their full quota of ward delegates for the GMC, right? In Thorston, nothing like it. And they can nominate from now until they fix the election date, right? And so the strategy, recruit new members like there's no tomorrow, right? Pack the GM, folk will vote for you. It's in the back. It is? It is. Well, small, you do the same. Well, we'll try, yeah, but... Uh, see, Thorsten, we're uh, talking about our pals from overseas, right? And on that, as it happens, Mr. Smalley's got his drawers in something of a tangle. The on John Smalley, MP for Sheffield East, from 64 to 70. Speech he made in 68 concerned with Kenyan Asians, the admittance of, I quote. Uh, whatever one's sympathies, and I have many, with these unfortunate people, uh, one must accept that the indigenous population will not forever stay silent when faced with what appears to be the thin end of a very thick black wedge. God. We do a leaflet, bung it round. We got it by the plums, Bob. Like a gerbil in a bucket. That's the lot. Right. Now you deserve another. I do. <laughs> That's all. I'm most impressed. Oh, well, well, sir. It's just a matter of know the rules. And then exploit them. Use. Good day. Yes. Just meeting people. Discreet canvassing. Who are you up against? Oh, half a dozen. The only real contender is one Major Rolfe, the starboard fringe. The type one puts just slightly to the right of Genghis Khan. He's spreading rumours I'm a Heathite. Are you? I suppose I am. Do you know the socialist? Not yet. Presumably some loony of the left. Anti-common market protectionist, all that. Oh, yes. Indeed. Congratulations. Good day to you. You got it all right. I'm nearly right. Three yards it done. It must have been them buggers brought and park is switched. Do you know why? Oh, uh, well, I should imagine not too well shot on the changing colour of the Thorsten delegation. Colour both senses. No, no, red they don't mind. So long as uh, red on white. 
<laughs> so now it's just the Tory left to beat. The Tory? There's a Tory. <laughs> 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 Forty-seven came on home, Major Rolfe, a face of stone, another England, seedy, drab, locked in the dreams of glories she once had. The Major looks at England and bemoans her tragic fate, condemns the mindless comforts of a flaccid sponge's state, despairs of trendy idiocies repeated as a rote, while the knot of old school tiredness is still tight round England's throat. Sees leaders fat with falsehood as they lick up every lie. The people's blood grown sickly with their driving will to die. Major Rolf sees the light. Calls for a counter from the right. Major Rolf, starboard seer, loses, for they will not hear. Oh! Lewis. Hank. Oh, how are you? Fine. And you? Oh, I'm fine. How's the boy? Alan? He's fine. Just been promoted. Ah, Captain. Splendid. Sails for Belfast on the midnight tide. Mm, that's fine. How's business? Brisk. And yours? Surprised, by the way, to hear you didn't get the Tadley nomination. Were you? Yeah. I wasn't. Didn't stand a chance, I thought. Not up against the perfect opposition. What do you mean? Oh, come on, Frank. He looked just right. Knew all the right words, too. Humane, concerned, constructive, moderate. But just the right note of apology in his voice when he had to admit to being a conservative as well. Yes, I think I know him. Is it Peter Crosby? He's a nephew of a friend of mine. Well, then you'll understand. Obsession with the mythic middle ground. And such surprise when he discovers that it isn't there. Ah, oh, well, what's it matter anyway, the state the party's in? What state might that be, Lewis? Ah, full of self-loathing, gutless, pandering to all the trendy myths. Still genuflecting to the sacred cows of Congress House. Oh, come along, Lewis. All that's changed. I read my daily telegram. Oh, yes, of course, we'll say the party's altered. Now we've understood we have the right approach. And yes, of course, at party conference, our new and true blue leaders to a, to a person. Bang the drum and flap the flag. Just learn from history. In practice, come the crunch. The flag they wave omits the red and blue. Will it be any different next time? Hmm? All right, Lewis. What's it all about? It's all about the state we're in. And who in Peter Crosby's grave new world is going to defend it? Lewis, surely not. Not what? Hello. Well, not Suffolk military geriatrics drilling private armies on their croaky lawns. No, oh, there's no need for private armies. Well, exactly. When we already have a public one. Not in England. Interesting fellow, Alan's brigadier. He's worked it out. Rather frightening, what they call scenarios. There's one that's particularly scary. It starts with unofficial miners' strikes in Yorkshire. Then there's occupations of redundant steel mills in South Wales, but things don't really start to take off until the OPEC countries halve the price of oil and cause the English pound to drop right through the English floor. Well, why talk to me? Oh, not just you. Any managing director of a major British company whose shares were 260 18 months ago and at close on Friday just topped 34. 
I'm sorry, Lewis, I just can't see it in those Armageddon terms. Won't see it. I still have some faith in people's reason. Reason? Your shop steward's reasonable, man. People's loyalty. What to? To Britain. No, that's meaningless. The national interest, then. Whose loyalty? Miners, students, oh. Irish, yes, all right, blacks. Yes, you talk yes, of their right. national interest and they listen. Lewis, the dogmas of class war no longer have any yes, meaning. And, and why? I will tell you whose commitment to our national interest matters and is under strain. <sighs> whose then? Not our sea officers. Not them, the troops. The NGOs. The people who've been betrayed. Lost everything security of property, social status, and the people for whom our new national role, our new lost empire role, as Europe's whipping boy, the awful warning system of the West, as seedy threadbare, quite uncharming and unlovable, the people for whom that is a betrayal of their lives. The lower middle class. The people I come from. And the state they're in. Let us commemorate and commend to the loving memory of our Heavenly Father, the shepherd of souls, the giver of life everlasting, those who have died in war for our country, and its cause. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. Technological miracle. Testing, testing. No, we've lost it all together. The testing, testing, testing. That's better. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I was saying, good evening to you all. Now, I've called this meeting, as most of you know, to discuss two things both of which are related to each other. One is the forthcoming by-election in Tadley, and the other is the possibility of the Patriotic League joining forces with a national organisation. And with that in view, we have here tonight that Mr David Maxwell, who is a leader of the Nation Forward Party, a truly a patriotic organisation, as I'm sure you'll agree, when you've heard what he's got to say. Uh, first, though, there is the uh, question of uh, paying for the room. And I wonder if anybody um, would care to... I'll, I'll do it, Mr Chairman. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Always collect before the speaker, eh? <coughs> oh, uh, while we're doing that, you should all have a bulletin. And there is uh, one thing I'd like to draw your eye to on page four. The item on parasitic worms at Thorston Junior. Because I have written to the medical officer of health about this. I think he's getting a bit fed up with me, actually. Anyway, perhaps in time he'll get fed up enough to do something about these immigrant problems in our schools. Oh. He wrote back in his usual soothing vein. Perhaps sometime he'll learn that the patriotic people of Tadley can't be soothed that easily. 
Then one of the things I said was that the, the thing about these parasitic complaints is that they're passed on by the cutlery and by using the same toilet. And he didn't say much about that in his reply. Well, there was just that one point uh, I wanted to point out to you before handing over to Mr. David Maxwell, who will explain to us all about uh, Nation Forward. Thank you very much. I thought, despite Mr. Turner's splendid build-up, that I wouldn't launch off into a great diatribe. I think you all know something about Nation Forward, and I think it would be far more useful to throw the discussion open now, so that you can ask the questions that you want answering, and most importantly, that I can listen to what you have to say. That stunned them all into silence, Mr. Maxwell. <laughs> Come on, I'm sure there's somebody. Well, one thing I think people might Mr. want to Chairman. ask. Mr. Chairman. Oh, Mrs. Howard, I thought you'd find your voice sooner or later. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I have been a member of the Conservative Party for 30 years. That's what I wish to say. Is that... Well, it... It would be complete anathema to me to support or vote for any other party. Well, are you saying... However, I, I'm, I'm afraid the party is not what once it was. Once it represented all the finest values of the middle class. It's now gangrenous. Well, I'm sure I, I'm sorry, it's, it's infiltrated from the left. The cryptos, the, the pale pinks. I'm sure of it. I recall it, you will understand, as once it was. That's all I have to say. Mrs. Howard, could I say that yours is entirely our view? Oh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to say something. Um, I'm sure what the lady says is true, but it's not just politics. Uh, my husband, he can't be here tonight, he lectures at the poly. And he's convinced of several things. One is that these so-called foreign students aren't studying at all. Well, they turn up once and then they disappear. He's also sure that almost 75% of the lecturers, and some of, the, of them are immigrants, are communists. And because of this, he might lose his job. Because he's a, a, a patriotic person. And he makes no secret of it. When they make the cuts and they're going to, it'll be the first one to go and the unions won't lift a finger. And, and another thing, it's folks like us who are working for Britain that are suffering the most. Like, when they talk about home ownership, what happens? The mortgages go up so far you can't even afford the payments. So you say, OK, we'll sell. But even that's impossible. Our house is in West Thorston, and if you say you're from Thorston, they start talking to you in pidgin English. So you can't sell or buy, and people get desperate. I mean, really desperate. Seems no way, you see. Anybody else? In my opinion, Mrs. Howard, I think just if anybody one else... point, Mr. Chairman, following on what the young lady has just said. The floor is yours. In my opinion, the lady is quite right. It is the silent majority that is suffering. In silence, as they watch their green and pleasant land growing more and more like an Asian colony. And the do-gooders. Isn't it time, Mr. Chairman, we thought about the victims for a change? That's what they're saying. The people on fixed incomes, with inflation. What about the people without a union? What about us? Listen, Mrs. Let me tell you something. I reckon I'm as patriotic as you are. 
But I'm in the union, and I've voted Labour all my life. I'll tell you what's bothering me. I'm in motors, steward in a foundry. And what concerns me with business like it is, if it's a British firm, it's going to go bankrupt. If it's an American firm, some tycoon in Detroit picks up the phone and says, more profit if we transfer the lot to Dusseldorf. And there's something else. What jobs there are, we ain't going to get. But that, if you know Baron Castings for our work, but come dinner time, there's that many turbans in the canteen. It looks like a field of bloody lilies. <laughs> oh, that smells like the black hole of Calcutta. And if one of them gets the push, they're all up in arms, screaming about discrimination. It's happening now. And no one's doing bugger all about it. That's what's bothering me. Not the erosion of your bleeding middle class values. Sooner or later, something's got to be done. So don't you talk to me. Mr. Chairman, turn me. I think uh, what the last speaker was saying, I mean, you know, you're middle class, aren't you? And you lost your business. I hope you don't mind me saying. It was the same. Big firm taking over. And I, tech me. I'm on the dump. But like you were saying, it, it just does seem to me that what class you are, same kind of... If perhaps I could come in there. Well, my friends, I said I thought I'd learn a thing or two from you, and by God, I was right. We've heard about subversion in the colleges, from Mrs. Howard, about the Tory party, and from Mr. Atwood on the local industry. But it's my view that the last speaker really grasped the point, that what we have in common is greater by far than what divides us. I am sure, for instance, that Mrs. Howard does not oppose trade unions as such, but their perversion to political ends. I'm convinced that Mr. Atwood does not oppose the honest profit, but speculative profiteering. Of course, we disagree on many issues, but more, much more unites us than divides us. You know, it's an old saying, but you can change your class and your creed, but you can't change the blood in your veins. But I'm afraid that we have something else in common here. To use a light-hearted phrase, we all feel things ain't what they used to be. More seriously, we all of us observe a gradual decay, disintegration in our fortunes and the fortunes of our nation. And perhaps there is a reason that we have a common enemy. Oh, it looks like many different enemies. To the young lady, it's the college reds. To Mrs. Howard, it's the banks who recklessly promote inflation and destroy her savings. To Mr. Atwood, it's the multinationals. And it's called by many names. Names of things we are taught to see as opposites. Liberalism. Communism. Finance capital. Things that, in fact, aren't opposite at all. Do you know, there are people who still laugh when we talk about a conspiracy, even when we look at those people who are promoting immigration, even when we look at those so-called guardians of free enterprise who sell their grain to bolster Bolshevism, there are those still who laugh when we talk about a conspiracy, a world conspiracy, but there is one small group of men and women who do not laugh. 
There is one small growing party which can see what is happening and is determined to reverse it. That is nation forward. And I hope in all sincerity that you will wish to join this party. Join with us and make our country great again. Well, uh, I suppose we should uh, follow that. In 58 came on home Gurjeet Singh Khera to a Midlands town. Another England, another nation, not the England of imagination. The labor market forces have an international will. So the peasants of the Punjab, people factory and mill. The sacred Kesh and Kangha, Kacha, Kala and Kirpan. The Sikh rejects so he can be a proper Englishman. Keep faith in human virtue while attempting to condone the mother country's horror at her children coming home. Gurjeet Singh Khera, once a slave, returns to haunt the Empire's grave. Dennis, Richard Cleaver. Good to meet you, Dennis. Oh, thank you. Uh, good to meet you. Please. Yes. Tony. Uh, Richard, thought you might like to see this. There's a dispute, a firm called Baron Castings. Blacks are banning overtime against discrimination, and the whites, of course, thought it might help. Manna from heaven. You young, you. Anderson. Hot me, Gakar. I mean, you. Mini Batman. Oh, that's, uh, you know, Rakash. Mr. Carey, Bob Clifton. How do you do, sir? <clears throat> Baron Castings, Mr. Clifton. Clifton. Sorry, Sorry. Mr. Clifton. Sorry. Yes. Uh, you know the situation? Well, in part. Well, sir, uh, we, we wondered if uh, perhaps uh, we you could want support. Yeah, go on. We gave you ours, voted for you, delegates from Thorsten, and gave you our support. Now we want yours. Right. So fill me in. Uh, sir, the. The dispute at Barron's began as a conflict over retime jobs. Uh, a higher workload was required for the same reward. Uh, however, as only unskilled workers aren't on uh, piecework, don't receive a bonus, and as uh, most are Asian, uh, this job retiming itself uh, uh, is uh, discriminatory. Dis disc discriminatory. Also, it has highlighted uh, discrimination in promotion as uh, high-paid molders jobs are going exclusively to whites. So, uh, because of this, uh, the unskilled workers uh, have imposed a, a ban on overtime. Yeah, go on. Uh, so, the union, we built it in the foundry for five weeks, fought without assistance, uh, passed motions, sent letters, uh, proceeded through correct channels. And even when dismissal notices were served on us, they did nothing. Sir? So we, we occupied their offices. <laughs> the union? <laughs> yes, that is right. <laughs> and then? <laughs> they made the ban official. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. So what's the problem? Uh, oh. The problem 
is whether for Mordus, the whites, it is official. Yes, of course. Okay, it's clear discrimination. Ban's official, mm -hmm. legal. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll make a statement backing you. Okay? Problem? Question. Yeah? What's in all this for you? Nothing. It doesn't gain me anything to swim against the tide. Rather the opposite. So why? I don't know. Tell me. Thank you. Not at all. <laughs> what is it, Mr. Turner? Clifton Labour. It bloody not about this nig dispute of Barons. He could have got his prick caught in his zip if he don't watch out. <laughs> 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 Morning, Dennis. Morning. Tony. In the story. <laughs> Tour is not much better. Rather worse, considering. <laughs> David. Lose your treasure. Dennis. Oh, tough. Oh, by the way, Dennis. Sir. Did you manage to look through the draft address? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Problems? Well, actually, uh, yes, one or two. Uh, Shoot. Well, uh, wait, you're left at this, but I found some of it a bit left wing. In what way? Well, I mean, a lot of it's great. I mean, the stuff on the nigs and law and order's red hot, but uh, this business about import controls and uh, nationalising banks, I mean, well, you know what I mean. Not exactly, no. Well, I'm not sure how it'll go down. You mean with the Tory voters? Uh -huh. <laughs> But we're not just after Tory voters, are we? Well, no. But, I mean, there's stuff in here about opposing wage controls. Of course we're opposed to wage controls. Only in so far as we believe the crisis is created by ruthless international speculators and it should not be paid for by the British working class. See? Mm, still. Good. And there's a parasitic worms. I beg your pardon? Uh, medical officers report on parasitic worms amongst immigrant school children. Yes, well, I thought it best to keep it fairly general. Yes, but this proves what I've been saying all along. Yeah, surely, surely. But we do have some general but statistics. This is bloody dynamite! Not we are not, we can't be, just a pressure group on any single issue, even one as central as the colour question. We are not merely hardline patriots. We are not certainly ex-Tories with a thing about the wogs. We are, Dennis, British nationalists with a cogent, distinct world picture of our own. See? I don't think you'd know him around here. All right, Dennis. I'll bow to your superior local knowledge. Ah, splendid. A veritable hive. Morning, Richard. Soldiering on, Tony. How's it going? Fine. Thank you, sir. Splendid. Keep it up. <laughs> Smiling over the address, huh? That's right. Any problems? Yes, Dennis was worried about some of the economic stuff. Living standards, banks. That's right. I pointed out the need to pose a definite alternative to the bankrupt policies of the old parties. Well, that's good. Particularly those of the Conservatives. Of course. You see, Dennis, unlike the Tories, we are not unconditional supporters of the economic status quo. Specifically, we oppose the spivs and parasites of credit or financial capital. At the same time, of course, seeking to eliminate the Marxists in the factories. Indeed, our view is that financial capital and communist subversion are just, in essence, two branches of the same conspiracy to undermine the nation's enterprise. Doesn't say that there. So it would seem. Dennis, why don't you and Elizabeth go and map out the visiting, huh? Right. And Tony, too. Well? Well? 
nation forward believes that the cause of our present crisis is not the legitimate wage demands of British workers, but the domination of our economy by a tiny clique of international capitalists. The very people who deliberately import cheap foreign labor and cheap foreign goods to undercut our wages and to throw us on the dole. Well, drop the wog bashing, it could be Tribune, David. So what do you want? Wicked unions holding the country to ransom? Eastbourne, Uber Alice, because that's what Turner and his Where in all this jolly stuff on the thieves' den of the stock exchanges and support for free productive industry? And where amid all this merry rhetoric about the plight of ordinary working folk is the need to isolate the commie wreckers? And where, in the midst of all this happy talk of democratic structures and meaningful participation, is the hint, no more the hint, that all men are not equal and that some were born to lead and others only fit to follow? Some, I suppose, meaning you. David, I am liable to lose my temper, Richard. I have had all morning with Turner and his medical paranoias. I am trying to run a campaign from a disorderly shoebox staffed by juvenile mental defectives. And to be quite frank, I couldn't give a toss about your temper. Were it not, David, for the boundless charity of those of us who, against all the evidence, saw behind your gauche facade the faintest glimmers of potential, you would still be in your army surplus pants and scout hat, goose stepping up and down in Epping Forest. Or perhaps organising Nordic Kultur Fests on Clapham Common. Or perhaps being sent down for laughable offences like attempting to arrest the Premier for treason. Or perhaps Richard! even... Well done, David. For a moment, then, you cease to look like something from the slime. Almost a prepossessing specimen for once. Uh, just had the post on. Apparently there's a room where we're going to check the Nick vote at the polling stations. They don't up to us what we we're going to do about it. What did you say? I told them. What do you think? Leave well alone. Oh, come on, Jim. Leave well alone. He's coming. He's coming. Mr. Crosby, I read your statement on this Baron's business. Yes. With any luck, they might come out. You'd welcome that. The rope is going to hang you, Mr. Crosby. Ah, Mr. Crosby, to what do we owe Mr. this? Mr. Turner. I've just been studying your plans to sabotage this by-election. Sabotage? I've come to ask you to reconsider your plans to harass immigrant voters. Quote, we do intend to monitor black voters during the election at the polling station. Oh, after the Nick vote, are we? <laughs> I have most unwillingly Look, come. I... You know as well as I do that half of them entitled and the other half votes twice. Will you reconsider? Will I, L? Then I shall report you to the returning officer. You <laughs> do that. There's no need, you know, to make the whole thing mucky. Drag us all. No need. But I suppose that's all part of your national regeneration, using these Gestapo tactics. Oh, I'm sorry, you'd probably view that as praise. Well, these red, bullshy, bully boy tactics, then. Mr. Crosby, I have an uncle. Oh, nice. Mine's dead. Goodbye, Mr. Turner. Who lives in Southall. Never been involved in politics. Probably votes Labour. And this harmless old fellow is quite genuinely terrified that after he's dead, sometime in the future, an Indian temple may be built over his grave. Which may seem absurd and, what's the jargon, paranoid to you. 
And it might seem very passé, very old-fashioned and very unhip to say that that old boy did not fight in two world wars to die for whatever reason, an unhappy, lonely, terrified old man. I think... I don't think there's any more can usefully be said. You see what we mean, Dennis? Feeble, flabby, like all Tories, slave to sentiment. <laughs> well, ah, uh, hello. Thanks for... Uh, what do you want? I want to talk about collaboration. I beg your pardon? A common front. On what? On race, in general, and this barren casting thing. Oh, I say. A common front. Bipartisan approach. That sort of thing. I see. Well. Those are just half a dozen letters, sample of my postbag. Just today, it's from members of my party saying that they won't canvas for me because of my uncommon line on race. In short, to keep my mouth shut, to sell out now, to play a lower profile, won't help me when I hote her, whereas you... All right. All right. I went to see them. Nation? Yes. Alarming. Well, you stagger me. More than that. More than a laugh. Go on. More. I remember long ago when I was small. The coronation. Climbing of Mount Everest. A kind of homely, dainty patriotism. Harmless, slightly precious, self-content. A watercolour world. <sighs> you know? And then, talking to these people. Their monstrous chauvinism. Grisly xenophobia. A dark desire for something. Something dark and nasty in the soul. And I thought, oh no, they can't be, can they? Our creation? Alter ego, somehow. All these ghastly people. Hey. I'm scared. Absolvent. You what? <sighs> oh, look, words of one, Jim. What are they after? Extended bonuses and end to so-called promotional discrimination. Can we concede the latter and ditch the former? No chance the whites won't wear it. Why? No cash in it for them. And giving them the lot? You'd still have bother now. Jim, you do understand why I'm here. Not really. It's a very small dispute. It was, while they were banning overtime. That's not my fault. That's bloody union. They said they'd back the ban and then they let the whites work normal. No wonder our sunburned brethren lost their rag. It's not my fault they're coming out on strike. Not my fault. Sadly true that with no manifolds or brake drums, we can't make motor cars. That's true. So, 
But can the police do nothing? They can, but they won't. Oh, but come on, Jim, it's an unofficial strike. You tell the good inspector. You can see their point. Cameras, press and all. It's tough for them politically. Can see my point. Three plants, dead stop. Tough economically for us. I think that's called a contradiction. Oh, Jim, for heaven's sake. Look, I know a man who's in something of a crisis. He decided about a week ago he couldn't cope with being a conservative. Which wouldn't matter if he wasn't standing for election as a Tory in four days. We all have problems. Yes. Remind me of the percentage, black to white. About four to one. Bad odds. What for? The picket line. Jim, can I use your phone? Of course. Mr. Turner, would you admit to racial prejudice? We all have a natural and healthy preference for our own kind. Colour? Well, that's what I mean. Certainly giving a nation a British passport doesn't make him British. Cat? Now, after all, if a cat's born in a kipper box, doesn't make it a kipper, does it? <laughs> <laughs> and have you heard the one about the packy? <laughs> Repatriation. Ordered and compassionate, humane. But we are honest enough to say that this cannot be voluntary. That includes all immigrants who were born here. No. What's wrong? Well, how on earth can an immigrant be born here? By remote control? No. Well, he... that's exactly what the hecklers want. And on the same score, Dennis, don't say they breed like rabbits. Why? Because then some joker shouts out, Queen Victoria did too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's strike at barons. But the main priority must be to resist present attempts to secure a backstairs deal between the immigrants and the company. Above. Over the heads. Over the heads of the British workers. A deal which once again would prove. Prove. The common interest. In, of the uh, multinationals and the multiracial elements in our midst. So? So? Naturally, in the event of the uh, management reneging on the interests of the ordinary white workers, we must show our support. No, Dennis, no. In the event of the management selling out the interests of the rank and file white workers, we must demonstrate our solidarity. Oh, oh that's right. Oh, sorry. Mr. Turner, I wonder if you could tell us just a little more about this common interest between the multinationals and the blacks. Well, it's then that attracts them, isn't it? I mean, they advertised in all the papers over there. And then, when they're here, it's them, the multinationals, who encourage them to so-called integrate. I see. Now, why should they do that? Wages. Ah, oh, to uh, undercut the wages of the white workers. Only wages. Jobs. That's right. To take jobs that would normally be given to the whites. No more than that. Nothing to do with makeup, breeding, and the aim perhaps to mongrelize. You are. To turn our nation to a mongrel race of khaki half castes. <laughs> oh, ah. Ah, oh, that as well, ah. Huh? Come on, Turner. You're just fascists in sheep's clothing. Tin pot furors out to overthrow democracy. That's not true. Come on, question, answer it. All right. If you'll let me, there's a simple answer. We want more democracy. We think that at the moment we're controlled by an undemocratic, cosmopolitan elite of Wall Street puppeteers who are behind the plot to undermine the nations, the free nations and impose a one-state world which is under their control. Their methods include uh, strangulation of national economies by saddling them with debt, and, and mongrelization, and communist subversion, and the creation of multinational monopolies. 
Well done. In its place, we wish to build a truly democratic, <laughs> nationalist society in which the views of everybody... Oh. What's funny? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> what's funny? Wall Street in alliance with the communists. Oh, dear me. <laughs> they financed the Russian Revolution. Financed the Russian Revolution? New York bankers? Oh, that's rich, that is. <laughs> well, it's been said... Look, I mean, for heaven's sake, what on earth have the financiers in common with the communists? Just tell me. What on earth in common? Just tell me what on earth in common. Richard, I don't get it. Or put another way, what British landlords, British tenants, British workers, British bosses have in common. The race? Can't hear. The race. And so, the others. Rothschild, Marx, Kissinger, Rosa Luxemburg, Oppenheimer, Lev Davidovich Trotsky, what they have in common. But should I am not an anti sea Dennis, the man who took your livelihood away, what was his name? Goodman. Monty Goodman. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Indeed. Oh, hold on. And so, the questioner's remark about democracy. What is democracy? What serves to me interests of the race? That's all for you. Hello? See what he's doing? Who? Herr Oberstgruppenführer. You know, he really has this vision of himself, he really does, in cap and flashes, striding through Earl's Court or somewhere, flanked by courts of the blondest and the brightest. <laughs> I mean, okay, the triumph of the will. But not just his. I don't in fact care how it comes about. I want a reason to have children. Yeah. That's right. Interesting call. Head office? No, not head office. Man asking us a favor. David, good night. Well, they've had a meeting. They've confirmed it. Pick it on, on Monday. Have you finished? Yes, I have. I'm going now. To London? Yes. I think... Mr. Cleaver wants you to go on. Like now.
давайте. Денис, there is in nationalist politics a tendency, it's often there, crops up from time to time, which holds that patriots should be opposed not only to international finance, but to private enterprise in toto, and all that follows. An obsession with democracy. Masses is against the individual, distrust of leadership. Marx, dressed up in patriotic weeds, that sort of thing. There comes a time when we cannot afford that sort of thing. We've had a little purge. a moment in one's life more terrible traumatic even than the ending of a first love or the consciousness of failed ambition or awareness of the fact of growing old It is the moment when you realize that you have more time, regard, respect for those who are your enemies than those you view as friends. That moment came to me last night while sitting in an aeroplane and flying northwards west across the Irish Sea um, to fetch the body of my son. He was, they told me, on the lower falls, arms raid. turned his head a second and the little boy the school kid at the tenth floor window with his sniper's gun aimed just above the hairline get on trouble probably been waiting there for hours waiting for that second patiently And on that plane, I realized that I had more time for him, the 12-year-old boy killer from the Divvies Flats, the dark child with his Russian rifle, far more time for him than they, the generals, the ministers, assured us that the sun would never set. The generals could not prevent my son in his high morning, his son going down. And they still won't see, will they? The generals, ministers, police chiefs. They won't see that we are at war in Belfast, Bristol, Bradford, Birmingham. The one we lost in Bombay 30 years ago, the one we're going to lose in Britain now, unless they see in time. Not thugs, 
nor lunatics, nor dupes of Moscow. Just ordinary men and women, sane and normal. Thousands of them. And there's no time. They're everywhere. Deep, deep inside the bat. There's no time. The sun has set. We should not remember, we should not look back, but think instead only of the morning. His fault. He turned his back. They say they'll get them in. Unthinkable to use these people. Impossible not to. All other options closed. They say they'll break the line and get them in. through the line. I do. Your voters, most of them, were back the whites. You think so? No. I know so. Yeah. Yesterday I did some visiting in Thorsten, I meant to tell you. Yeah. And met a widow. Sixty-four the only white face in the street. No English shops, can't buy an English newspaper, the butcher's gone and the kids smash our windows. Of course the white kids did as well. But then she doesn't see it quite like that. And an old boy, 60-ish, T and G shop steward who refused to take a cut in bonus rates. He got the push, his job went to a Pakistani. Of course, it could have gone to anyone. But there again, he doesn't view it in quite that perspective. And a man I know. I'm married to him. said working through the Labour Party, broad church, all that, kind of need to make a deal. The credit side, to be of use to people, working for actual and factual change. And on the debit side, To realize the limits, changing things through dual processes, the slowness, loss of purity, the need to listen to Vox Populi, B 
be brave enough to compromise. People who voted Labour all their lives. It's all this for? For when they come and ask for your support again. Well, don't we meet people in the strangest places? <laughs> hey, look, Bob. Don't mean to pry or anything, but uh, what are you doing in here, like? Got arrested. A snap. Waiting to be charged. Yeah. Snap again. Uh, Bit of aggro, but barring castings. Yeah. You know, there's this uh, dispute. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. So you were on the picket line? Of course we're on the bloody picket line. We had to break the bloody picket, weren't we? We? Yeah, we. Nation forward. I was on the picket line. <laughs> oh, blimey. What's bloody funny? Oh, blimey, Paul McShane. Great fighter for the working class. Sorry me, that gang of nigs to undercut the wages of his brother worker. Ooh, Tony, that's Listen, why did you people ever realise? What? We didn't ask for it. Ask for what? Have backies take our jobs and houses. Turning England's green and pleasant land into a nation's slum. We uh, didn't ask for uh, Green and pleasant? Yeah, just like round here with all them uh, lovely trees. Verdant foliage. For Christ's sake, Tony, who have you been talking to? I don't need to talk. I know. It's in the blood. The spirit of the race. Oh, Christ. The bleeding master race. Oh, blimey. You really don't know, do you? Know what? Your real enemy. Well, Actually, I take the old-fashioned view that for the working class, the enemy... Oh, ah, the bosses. Which? Well, answer. Have a sniff, Paul. Got a nose. Can smell the alien stink, or can't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, can do. Yeah, smell the foul stench of all them uh, black speculators, packy stockbrokers, Jamaican managing directors. Not them, Paul. No, not them. The ruling class. No, Paul. The ruling race. All history is the struggle of the classes. All history is the struggle of the races. The workers of all races must unite. The workers of all classes must unite. Come down to it, the choice is socialism or barbarity. Come down to it. It's Zionism, one world tyranny, or us. And when we win, get rid of them. There'll be no need for conflicts, class wars, strikes and all. Then capital and labour work together in the interests of the nation. Putting Britain first, the nation overall. Of course, you can sneer at race and blood. But everything you've got, Paul, comes from that. Everything healthy, worthy. Everything with any meaning values from the blood. Because seed don't die. What we are don't die. Passed on from generations. Passed on from legions of the dead to legions of the living, legions of the future. Tony. Last time they said that, ended up shoveling people no into more. bloody ovens. It didn't happen. What? You see, they couldn't. Not six million. They weren't six million anyway. 
Don't it? Uh, Auschwitz and all just factories. The photos forged. The whole thing was trumped up. Invented by the Jews. You're a Nazi. Yeah. That's right. Too good for them! Right, Mr. Patel, let's go through it just once more. You claim you entered when? They've arrested Prakash Patel. What? Yeah. And they're reckoning on doing me for assault. Sit down. Uh, no, boom. If you rang the dailies now, you could get a statement. They're, they're doing Patel for assault. Uh, no, no. Oh, I thought Illegal you said immigrant, sir. Immigration Act of 71. But there's an amnesty. It doesn't cover. He's an oversteer. Came in here as a student, just didn't go back. Poor sod. Where is he? Up at the cop shop. And they found out? Oh, Platt. It has to be. The bastard knew and shopped him. Yeah. Well? Right, now he's an overstayer, right? Oh, well, so they but say. But he is. Well, I suppose so. So, in fact, he's breaking the law? Well, yeah. Now, that does make it, well, a bit difficult. Why? Because if he's breaking the law, Bob obviously can't demand his release. Why not? Obviously. But it's what you've been saying all along. Oppose the Immigration That's Act. That's not what you're asking him to do. Bob's asking for the law to be changed, not broken. Well? Say something. What do you want me to say? Well, actually, that your good lady's talking out the back of her neck. She isn't. Oh. I see. No, you don't. So I'll explain. Yeah, I'm all ears. Now look, Paul, I'm standing for election as a legislator, right? That's the job description. I'm doing that. I can only do that if I believe that laws should be made, OK? And that it is possible to change society by making them. Yeah, but what is... So how, if that has any meaning at all, can I say that once they're made, we shouldn't keep them? It's a matter, simple, of the rule of law. You've got to see the problem, Paul. Oh, I can. I'm talking to it. It's sitting there, stuffing its face with chicken biryani. The law's a car, Paul. Goes whichever way you steer it. So why whoever's driving does it always go the one way? The rule of law. The blacks, the Irish, all of us, a lesser breed without the rule of law. I'm sorry. You will forgive me, sir. Very interesting debate. But I have got to get up at seven in the morning. Picket duty. Yeah, well, that says it, doesn't it? That just about bloody says... Do you know, sometimes, Paul, your self-righteousness reaches a pitch of messianic fervour that I find quite <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> you what? You heard. So far removed, your cosy dogmas, sterile constructs are so pure, so untouched by the real world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it must be very nice to be like you, in a way. Detached. Able to see both sides. I mean that, actually. But sooner or later, Bob, you're going to have to make up your mind which side you're on. Because you're standing on a little pack of ice that's floating in a sharky sea. And there's too many people on it, Bob. And the bug is melting away. Turn on. Well done. I didn't have much choice. You did. <laughs> Conservatives are defending a 1,127 majority in a four-corner contest. Hopes are rising for a settlement of the three week old Comrade! Comrade! Hey, can we have that thing off? Following mortar attacks by popular front. Sorry, comrades, interrupt the evening. We've got a brother here with us. A dumb Matthews from Baron Castings. 
Just a few words, you know, sure. Brothers? Brothers, please! Brothers, uh, I'm sure you've all heard about this business up at Barron's. You know, press and all. Uh, and though this evening we're like more concerned with casting votes than what we are with casting. Castings. You know, the cast... Sorry. Uh, oh yeah, being arrests uh, and one Indian, he's an illegal immigrant and they're reckoning deporting him uh, and obviously the strike committee is after money, pay the fines, fight the deportation, all that. And it's all about this strike, about promotion, this, um, well you know, being promoted all, uh, alleged, and as you know, it's unofficial what they're doing. And you'll know that most of us, the whites, well, don't agree with it and broke the picket line and kept on breaking it. Some, of course, a few, they stayed away. Perhaps they don't like breaking pickets, even coffee-coloured pickets. So they stayed away, avoid the bother. And some, that's even fewer, you can bet. That's very few. They even went and joined the bloody picket line. A few, like me. And that's no ball of fun. Because let's be honest, all of Tadley, not just Barons, hatred running through like Blackpool runs through rock. And blokes are saying, well, I don't mind them, but me mates, so I'll keep quiet, you know. I mean, it ain't that easy, a place like Barons now. I mean, the rot's that deep. They won't see what war they're in, who with. Because, I mean, what's the Nazis now? They're comic bits in Colditz. They won't think what happened in the past. Won't think about tomorrow. Because first will be the blacks and Asians. Then the Jews and Irish. Now this isn't easy speeches, this is true. And then will be the unions. Oh ah, make no mistake. The Labour Party. That'll go. The others too. All in the interests of the nation. And to save the nation, They'll destroy the nation, all of it except themselves. And if we let them, we've got ourselves to blame. Our fault. We turned our back. So we don't want your money. Well, I suppose all right, but if that's all you're giving, then forget it. Want you on that bloody picket line. That's all. I, the undersigned, being the returning officer for the parliamentary constituency of Tadley, hereby give notice that the total number of votes cast was as follows. Bennett, J. Liberal. 1,052. Liberal. Christian, Robert John. Labour. 10,096. Yeah. 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 Peter Sanderson. Conservative. 11,000. Yeah. 11,000 Labour. Yeah. Dennis Stephen. Nation Forward. 6,933. <laughs> and that the undermentioned person has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency, Peter Sanderson Crosby. <laughs> Um, seven bloody thousand.
Foley. Foley. Come on. Hi, Paulie. Come on, mate. Hello. Paul's pet monkey. No. Well then. Tell me, who you think you doing all this for? Hmm? Well, they said they might be late. The meeting, the implications of the Deutschmark doing something or another. I was there, you know. In 1857? No, from 1945. Richard, I'm sorry. This is Lewis Rolf. Hello. How do you do? I'm um, Dennis Turner, Lewis, who I think you've met. Oh, yes, indeed, long time ago. Congratulations, Dennis. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, there's no need for that. Well, 23%, you'll be delighted. Oh, uh, low poll, but uh, it's a start. <laughs> deposit saved as a deposit earned. <laughs> well, uh, do, please, sit down. Thank you. Well? We need to know exactly. Yes, of course. Yeah. Ah. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, the answer to your question. Nothing. Yet. It's just a matter of see the whites in each other's eyes. Perhaps the word's insurance. Against the moment when the center, the liberal and democratic center, cannot hold. When in extremists, there might be a need to go to the extreme. To bind the nation to itself. Unite the Durham miner with the Surrey stockbroker, the East End navvy with the Scottish laird. To bind the barrel fast with hoops of steel. An ideology. Red, white and blue in tooth and claw. Sometime there's more to it than that, of course. Fighting the Reds wherever they appear, the schools, the factories. Why not the police? The police are isolated, they don't know. You, the Reds, are on your streets, you know. The army? Can contain, perhaps. They can't destroy. We also combat international capital. We also need protection. If it means control. You scratch us, we scratch you. You'd sacrifice the free of enterprise. We might, in order to preserve the privacy of property. One doesn't like the dentist, but perhaps to save a tooth. Mm. Physicians. I mean, please. Just tranquilize. To numb the pain. You surgeons. Use the passions. Rechannel the hot blood. Send it gushing down another artery. Conditions? There's no question of conditions. There's no question of a deal. But if we were maybe a tendency among your people, shall we say, a little far to port? Oh, yes, our little group of racial Trotskyites. <laughs> Who Maxwell and his Bolshevik band aren't with us anymore. I see. And money? Not yet. Not yet at all. And this um, approach is just you? Just us. 
Hardly United Vehicles, not now. <clears throat> Hardly the Metropolitan Investment Trust. Not ever. <laughs> oh, yes, I see, of course. What did you say? No, I'm sorry. What did you say your firm was? Well, the Metropolitan Investment Trust. Well, shall we continue where we love? Why not? <laughs> yes, I thought we might try somewhere new in Cornhill. That is, if you like it, Tanya. Mm. Well, thank you. I'm sorry. I thought you'd all left. They have. Are you not lunching? No. Fine. Ghastly, isn't it? It's him. Sorry. Your boss. The Metropolitan Investment Trust. I don't quite see. People who took my livelihood away. Because I'm suffering a gross deficiency of greed. Dennis, what's the matter? Aren't you coming? No. Something about we took his livelihood. Dennis, it doesn't matter. All well, that's in the past. The future, that's what matters. Think of the morning. Not might, not could, not will. It is. It is happening here. And what can stop us now? Tell me. Only one thing could have stopped our movement. If our enemies had understood its principle and had destroyed, with all brutality, the nucleus of our new movement. Hitler, Nuremberg, 3rd of September, 1933.